everyone. Welcome to the Sunday New Play Showcase. I'm Rachel Kohler and I will be your stage manager this afternoon. Today we've got three delightful plays about Shakespeare. One by Christina White, one by Paul Ahrens, and one by me. I'm really excited to start out with Christina White's brand new play, True Dane. Christina, why don't you come out here and introduce yourself? Hi, Rachel. Hi, Christina. Can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write this play? Uh, actually, you were the, you kind of kickstarted this whole thing. You said, uh, I, and I quote, you seem like the kind of enterprising, nerdy playwright that would have a uh, Shakespeare themed play lying around. And uh, I told you that, uh, no, I didn't have a whole play. I, I had a, an idea and I, I'd see where it would take me. And that wasn't the truth. I didn't even have an idea. <laughs> what I had was a kind of gripe. Um, I, had read uh, I had read Hamlet and I'd seen several productions of Hamlet. And after about the second or third production, I, I started thinking, this play is too long. <laughs> it's, it's like, it could use some cutting, you know, but after all, it, it's, it's, it's Hamlet and it's Shakespeare. And who am I to say, you know, really you could, you could cut some of this. And, and from that gripe, uh, uh, an idea was born and the, and, and the idea was what if Hamlet had an evil twin? Now that she could say, whatever she liked to, to Hamlet or, or Shakespeare, in fact. So, so from that idea was uh, born uh, True Dane, the Hamlet saga. And that's the play. All right, well, I think everybody's going to enjoy it a lot. So let's bring our actors on and have them perform for you. Christina White's brand, brand new short play, True Dane. So we are uh, in a, a small garret. William Shakespeare is uh, seated at a plain wooden table. And before him is a lot of paper and loosely scattered around the table and, and a quill pen. To one side, there's a laptop. Behind him, a window. Shafts of sunlight pour through the glass panes. The rather imposing figure of Hamgets faces around the room, impatient. That's impossible. Not only is it possible, William, it is in fact true. I stand before you, flesh and blood, Ham gets herself. You will address me as Master Shakespeare. I will address you any damn way I please. You've ignored me for 500 years, now that you can hear me and see me, I'll call you whatever I like. There is no Ham gets. It's Hamlet, the tragedy of Hamlet. I was always there. You men have given us women short shrift ever since for centuries. In my case, there is no shrift at all. As of today, I'm putting an end to it. And believe me, you will be glad I showed up. I am not now, nor will I ever be glad you showed up. You, you stomp around the room, you disturb my peace, and stick this this infernal machine in front of me it's a laptop william it's going to save you a ton of time and you won't have all those uh, ink stains to deal with i like my ink stains they are the hallmark of a truly prodigious prolific and phenomenally brilliant playwright well mr prodigious prolific phenomenal playwright i'm here to tell you your time is up my time is never up. My work has made me immortal. Immortal schmortal, you're never as good as your, as your next play. There will be no next play if you continue to interrupt this me. This is not an interruption. This is an intervention. I am saving you from yourself. I'm here to take you into a new millennium. Time for a makeover, a rebirth, if you will. The new Shakespeare is about to be born will make you relevant. Re relevant? 
How am I not relevant? I've written the greatest plays of all time, replete with characters of every kind, class, every characters who have expressed themselves in language that is unforgettable, the characters who have lived through events that are epic, royal, mysterious, magical, absurd, comical, tragical, Blah, 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 blah. Right there is an example of what we need to change. You go on and on and on. Now, it's true. Some of your language is splendid. Oh, some of my language? Yes, some. Some of your language is glorious, but there's too much of it, way too much. Take, for instance, the play you left me out of. I did not leave you out of anything. Hamlet has no twin sister. Wake up and see the family resemblance, William. What? You see, do you not, that in my physical appearance, I look like Hamlet? Admit it. He's a man. A man who looks like me. True, we're not identical twins, but you see the resemblance. I know you do. Now, here's the difference that's gonna save your bacon. What does Francis Bacon have to do with this? I, I don't care what they say. He did not write my plays. It's an expression, William. It doesn't have anything to do with Sir Francis Bacon. Oh, so he's, he's Sir Francis and I'm William. Insult upon insult. You are getting off point. As I was saying, though I bear a physical resemblance to Hamlet, my temperament is entirely different. And that difference is the very thing you said it in the first Hamlet. The play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. In the new Hamlet, wherein you'll, you'll introduce Hamgets, moi, the difference is in my confidence, my impertinence, and this is no coincidence, the king will be dispatched with expedience. A bit wordy yourself, aren't you? Well, sorry, I got carried away. Now, as I was saying, this is not only a new century, it's a new millennium. People have read and seen and streamed so many stories, they're way ahead of you. I don't care how great you think your language is, nobody's gonna sit through five acts to get the bad guy. None of this to be or not to be, whether it is nobler in the mind, blah to suffer the slings and arrows. A loud thumping and knocking sound. What was that? Yeah, it was, it was nothing. It was not nothing. Whoa, sound the alarm, double negative. And then again, a loud thumping and knocking. Is there someone at the door? Well, calm down. There's no one at the door, it's the wind. What wind? There is no wind. It's a perfectly calm day. Please pay attention. Is there a reason to hope for a little peace and quiet? Are you, are you going somewhere? Is there a reason to hope for a little peace and quiet? William, we have washed upon the shores of an extraordinary island. A little island of time given to us by the gods of theater so that I may help you understand this brave new world you've stumbled into. I want no part of it. What do you mean you want no part of it? Do you or don't you want to be a playwright for the ages? I already am. Yes, for the ages gone by. I'm here to ensure your future. William Shakespeare, a playwright whose work rockets like a comet into the future, forever bright, forever glorious. Keep talking. They will say of you, he was a man. Take him for all in all. We shall not look upon his like again. Crashing sound as if someone has busted through a locked door. Enter Hamlet, who has just busted through a locked door. He's frantically tearing away a cloth cover over his mouth. That's my line, my line, mine. And it isn't we shall never see his light again. It's I shall never see his light again. Hamlet. I knew I should have used duct tape. You, you, there is no word. You are, wait, there is a word. Evil, you are evil. See, this is exactly why I had to lock him up. The minute he shows up, he's accusing me of being his evil twin. 
Exactly. This is exactly what you are. Evil. Evil, Schmeevil. If I were truly evil, I would have finished you off on the spot. Did I do that? Well, no. No, I did not. I could have used duct tape, and just now, it would have ripped your skin right off. Am I right, or am I right? What is duct tape? It Wouldn't uh, goose tape be stronger? Furthermore, and William, I want you to hear this, I left you in that locker room with total access to Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, Sling, and Fubo. Total access. Is that the truth, or is it not? Yes, it's true. Tell William. It's true, Master Shakespeare. I did have total access. It was excessive, really. Overwhelming. What is Fubo? What is Hulu? Hobo? Hulu? What are you talking about? I'm talking about your future, William. And yours too, Hamlet. My future? Yes. The point I've been trying to make is this. If you want the Shakespeare legacy to continue, you have got to make your plays shorter. We've got to cut some lines. A lot of lines. No, no, not one word. Not my line, surely. Yes, even some of your lines. And <laughs> don't call me Shirley. I refuse to listen. I also uh, have to refuse. I love my lines. Would you rather have all of your lines? Or would you rather have your life, your lines, or your life, oh brother of mine, choose? What do you mean? I mean, with a little rewrite, well, actually, it's a major rewrite, but still, we'll, we'll keep the bones of the script, but William, it, it's time to hit the gym. We're gonna cut the fat, get fit, and muscle up. Who is, who's Jim, and why are we hitting him? It's a metaphor. What were you saying about my lines or my life? What do you mean? I'm saying in this new Hamlet, two acts, tops. And with the introduction of yours truly, Ham Gets, you can monologue and play the madman and kill the wrong guy and put on a theatrical murder mystery whilst I, your clever cunning twin, discover what our evil uncle is plotting and foil him. Foil him? Foil, you say? Yes, my dear Hamlet, I'm saying that this is a new ending. You don't have to die. Of course he has to die. Everybody dies. It's a tragedy. No, William, you have to throw off your doublet and your feathered cap. Think like a modern man, a 21st century scriptwriter. This isn't a tragedy. Hamlet lives. There's a sequel. I live. Yes. We'll have a new title, gentlemen. I thought about this and I believe I have a winner. Listen, listen. True Dame, True Dame, the Hamlet saga. Huh? True Dame is good. True Dame, I don't think so. You're leaving me out of it? It's my idea. No, no. You're an exciting new character, the surprise personage. You don't want to give it all away in the title, do you? Hmm. Maybe you're right. What is going on here? Hamlet, you're not listening to this, this... Genius. Master Shakespeare, she has a point. This is a brand new, brave world. We all know how much you love me. The lines you wrote for me are among the greatest, most memorable lines ever written. Just think. If I live. And if I at least have a life. Here's your chance to write a new play, an opportunity to create more glorious language, another great play. Methinks there is in this some measure of merit. It is not what I expected. I thought it was much ado about idiocy, but, but I find I am intrigued. Yes. 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 Hmm. And the truth is, I'm loath to admit it though, I, I've been suffering through some of the most horrendous case of writer's block. Then you're on board? Yes. Yes. I am, as you say, on board. It's time to write 
True Dane, the Hamlet saga. Thunderous thunderclap. Oh no. What was that? Where's the sun? What is it? We're almost out of time. There were only four conditions for any of this to happen. First, for you to see me and hear me, Master Shakespeare. Oh, now I get some respect. Time, the clock is running out. Yes, Hamgets, I see you, and I most certainly have heard you. Good, the second condition, for you to love me, even a little bit, my brother. I do love you, sister, and I forgive you for the lockup. The third, for both of you to agree to a new Hamlet. We agree. We agree. Thunderclap, another thunderous thunderclap. And the last, most important condition, if I'm not to disappear and be forever erased from memory. What? What is this last condition? Before the third thunderclap, one of you must guess my full name. What is this, Rumpelstiltskin? Take a guess, my full name, take a guess. Ham gets Danish? It is it a joke, Hamlet? You're gonna disappear into the old you. You'll die. No sequel. But how are we supposed to? Just think about it. It's a play about revenge. Oh, of course. Oh, the third thunderous thunderclap. For an instant, the stage is pitched into darkness. William has a revelation. Ham gets even. But Ham gets even is gone. Both Hamlet and William look around disoriented, neither seeing the other. What an odd thing to say. Makes no sense at all. Oh well, there are more things in heaven and in earth. There's the sound of rain, music, a soft, sad melody. William looks out the window at the rain. Hamlet settles into a familiar melancholy. Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would melt. Thon res uh, resolve itself into a dew. How wary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the useless of the world. Exit Hamlet. William returns to the table. The laptop is gone. He picks up a piece of paper, looks at it, and crumples it up and tosses it. Nothing. I've got nothing. Curtain, or what you will. <laughs> Yay, that was so fun. I giggled so much when I read this script. I was really excited to feature it. Can we have our wonderful actors out for some quick bows? All right, we had Patrick Chavel as Shakespeare, Jessica Kinsey as Ham Getz, and Soren Smithred as Hamlet. Thank you all so much. That was so much more fun in your voices than it was just reading it. All right, now let's move on to our second play, Paul Aaron's A Late Winter's Tale. Paul, you wanna pop out here and tell us a little bit about this play? All right, Paul's coming. This one was very fun. Oh, there he is. There's Paul. All right, oh, you're okay. Ready? Yay, yes. all right, yes. Paul, tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write this play. Well, <laughs> as you know, this was uh, last year's uh, Iron Thespian. I was, uh, was part of that and uh, was a writer for it and uh, we're given some, a few lines, I mean, a, a line, a prop, uh, a theme, I think, something like that, and given uh, about 12 hours. Something like I think that, it yeah. was about tw 12 hours to, uh, to create a play. And uh, I was uh, basically driven by what, what I had for, I had two actors, a man and a woman. And, uh, always loved uh, 
uh, Shakespeare. So uh, I said, okay, I, I, these two, what would be a good, uh, to, let's make them some Shakespeare characters who would be good. Uh, and uh, Oberon Titania jumped to mind. So it was okay. After A Midsummer Night's Dream is over, what's the relationship between Oberon and Titania? And it went from there. Well, awesome. Personally, I've always wondered how they made up after the events of Midsummer Night's Dream. So that's one of the reasons I like this play so much. So please, everyone, sit back and enjoy a late winter's tale. We can hear woodland sounds, crickets, peepers, wolf howls, etc. Titania sits painting on a canvas that is to us unseen. In the background, the majestic mascot Matisasaurus poses for her painting. She talks to invisible fairies that surround her. There we go. <laughs> Isn't that a pretty color? I love how the purple sparkles. Mm, splashes of magenta. The iridescent greens. A dab here, a dab there. Hmm. Here and here. Now that would be silly. Who ever heard of translucent pixie dust in a serious work of art? Hmm. Hmm. Don't pout. Hmm. Whoever, uh, maybe in my next painting, after I'm famous. What? Now that would be wonderful. Paint the wind. It would soar. It would sweep. It would carry you away like great art. What color do you think the wind is? Perfect. Oh dear, now I'm tired. Keep watch over me while I sleep. Titania lays down, holding the majestic mascot Matisse and nods off. Oberon enters, creeping stealthily towards the sleeping Titania. The fairies hover around him like gnats. He tries to fight them by waving aimlessly at them. Frustrated, he makes a dramatic sweeping gesture. She'll be gone! Now unharassed, he approaches the sleeping Titania. He circles her. Oh, my beautiful Titania. Love of my life. But even in sleep, you are fairer than the fair, sweeter than the sweet, lovelier than the lovely. And with all the power I possess, you won't let me next to you. And my bed is empty without you. Loneliness grieves me. Am I never to be forgiven? Tatanya awakens, stretches, yawns loudly. Tatanya is muted. <laughs> Ah, oh, what a wonderful dream. Oh, hmm. Mm. Oh, it's, it's you. What are you doing here? Titania is having technical difficulties. <laughs> oh, dear. Ah, uh, fairy magic may fix it all in a moment. Looks well, like it just, it needs to be plugged in. <laughs> okay. She always does that. Always. It's nerve wracking, really. Last century, I could tell you stories. Oh my gosh, really. <laughs> so here I wait, like I always do. I always do. Yeah. Women. <laughs> Fairies. Fairies. 
passes. <clears throat> All right. Just going to sanitize my hands. With practice. Oh, Zoom, you trouble me. Vexing. Yeah, Oberon, you don't know where those fairies have been. You know, I can tell. You should, you should see her when she's getting dressed when we have plans. <laughs> what a silly dream. I know technology took over for a moment there. <sighs> um, what a silly dream. Uh, 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 what a silly dream. Uh, was it too good to be true? Oh, it's you. Did you scare off my fairies? How mighty of you, Oberon. Titania gets up and crosses away from Oberon. I, I like your painting. It captures the light beautifully. Is it finished? Can I show it to some art people I know? Titania <sighs> shrugs. Like this? <sighs> Whatever. You can take it. Whatever. No big thing. Take it and go. <sighs> Please. Oh, <it's> <laughs> uh, and here's your buddy Francis. I would say that the joke's on you, but it isn't really. <laughs> Oberon crosses to her. He reaches out to touch her. Titania brushes his hand away. Don't touch me. Oberon backs off, then reaches out again. Titania delivers a slap to him. Oberon backs off in surprise. No. When? Then? A week? A month? A year? A decade? A century? You can't go on like this forever, which is a really long time if you're immortal to kiss and make up. We always do. Oh, this loneliness is killing me. Titania starts it to comfort him, then stops. Look, I appreciate your longing. I really do. I have longings too, but time still hasn't healed these wounds. It's just not a passing thing this time. You really hurt me. Oberon paces. How can I accelerate time? It's all especially relative. Time's arrow pierces the thickest of hides. Oh, we shall ride the bolt of time and see when it takes us. Let's go. Oberon backs off stage, beckoning towards Titania, drawing her with him by unseen forces. She tries to resist, but the force is too powerful and she follows him off stage. The woodland sounds give way to the sounds of waves crashing on a beach, seagulls calling. Oberon and Titania enter. Oberon walks backward with Titania continually drawn to follow. Oh, I love the feel of wet sand between my toes. Oh, wait, sorry. Um, What are you saying, honey? I can't hear you. Oh, pardon me. Technical difficulties. <sighs> magic, magic. Ah, oh, oh, I do love the sea breeze. Mm, the smell and the air. The feel of wet sand between my toes. Mm. Oberon turns and strides. Titania hurries to catch up. Not just yet. Oh, that sweet smile of yours. Your eyes sparkle, your cheeks dimple. Ah, oh, my heart melts. Shall I throw myself into the cold ocean to show you how much I love you? That will not be necessary. <sighs> or useful. It's not a question of how much you love me. It's a question of how much you respect me. How can I respect you? 
my love too has no bounds. Respect. Yes. R E S P E C T. You should know what it means to me. How yes. much it means to me. Yeah, I get it. Love conquers all, but respect has to be earned. I can work with that. I have been taking you for granted for too long. I can see. I can see that. Huh? What can I do to re-earn your respect? Any ideas? Show me your heart. Be vulnerable. No groveling. I hate groveling. Satanya folds her arms and looks askance. Oberon wanders aimlessly, wordlessly muttering to himself, building to a heated argument within himself. Oberon finds a flat, smooth stone and flings it into the ocean, skipping one, two, three times before it sinks. He throws up his hands triumphantly. Yes! <laughs> I still have it after all these years. The Mac never dies. That's, that's not vulnerable. I know, I know, I'm just getting prepared. Oberon crosses to Titania and takes her hand. He strides purposefully off down the beach and off stage. The sounds of the ocean and the seagulls give way to a howling wind. Oberon and Titania enter pushing against the force of this wind. Oberon shelters her as much as possible. Why are we here? It's cold. It's, it's windy. The chill factor must be 20 below. Zero. Not even, it's not even a winter wonderland. Just a sound and fury. This is ridiculous. Titania stops, turns her back to him and the wind, folds her arms, shivering. Oberon removes his coat and wraps it around her. He steps back and shivers violently. Ugh. I hate the cold. I hate snow. I could freeze to death here. But it would be worth it just to see you smile. <laughs> Only your embrace can save me. Only our hearts together have enough warmth to melt the icy frost. He opens his arms to her, slowly stiffening in the freezing cold. Titania ponders briefly, then runs to him. She embraces his frozen body. Oh, oh Oberon, feel my heart. My passion, my respect for you. You are my one and only. Oberon does not move or speak, a frozen statue. Oh, oh dear. Oh dear. Oh dear. More fairy troubles and magic. More fairy troubles and magic. Oh dear. Oh no. Oh no. Oberon. Oberon, oh, come hither, fairies. Oberon is dying, really dying. We must uh, conjure our hearts. We must stop the wind. How do we do that? Okay. Um, okay, if we carry a one, and we, we can we can create a, a very a fairy vortex. Yes, uh, just shuffle the wind. All right. All right, fairies. The wind falls to nothing, and birds begin to chirp. Titania holds Oberon. She looks to the sky, feeling the warmth of the sun. Oh. Oberon's fingers move, then his hands, then his arms. Slowly, he embraces Titania. At last... My love. Curtain. 
Oh, thank you, actors. I mean, we had some technical difficulties there, but that's how y'all know that this is live theater. Part of the fun is working for our technical difficulties to create theater that is rich and exciting anyway. And I mean, it's always great to see an actor's skill at ad-libbing when things go wrong. So let's get our actors out here and recognize how wonderful they are both at acting and ad-libbing. <laughs> We had Angelique D. Morgan as Oberon and Zena Allen as Titania. And sadly, my dog was not up for, <laughs> he's, he's just passed out on the floor. So, um, but Zena. thank you for, for trying. Yep, thank you for trying. Um, yeah. So, anyways, silly Wonderful. magic. Thank uh, you. Fairy magic. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. And thank you, Paul, for such a fun play. I love all the sprinkles of references to different Shakespeare plays all throughout. It makes me really happy as a huge Shakespeare nerd. All right. And now we're going to get to our last play of the day. Um, this feels a little weird since it's hard to interview myself, uh, but I wrote this play enough in response to the March quarantine bake-off that was sponsored by the University of Minnesota. In much the same way as we do Iron Thespian, they offered a list of things that you needed to incorporate into the play and then gave you about 24 hours to write it. So I banged this out overnight and finished at about 3 a.m. that morning. Um, some of the things it had to incorporate were hand sanitizer and a virtual dance and a light in the darkness. So see if you can find all of these things. So let us present Enough by me. When birds do sing, hey, ding -a -ding -a -ding. An outdoor theater, empty. It is night, a quiet, disturbed vaguely by crickets and little else. The moon touches everything with dim fingers. A man lies prone on the stage on his back, by his side a flagon of wine. One suspects that this flagon is largely empty. He is humming tunelessly in the general direction of the sky. A beat. Mm -hmm. Then a light in the dark, one yellower than the moon, bobs through the empty house towards the stage. The light, upon closer examination, is a lanthorn carried by another man who seems considerably more steady on his feet. Mm, lovers, lovers. <laughs> Will, oh my God's teeth! Will, go oh, thou drunken sot! The devil take thy poxy arse! Will, theaters closed, go thy ways. I <laughs> theaters closed, yet still I see thy arse upon the boards. When a man locks himself into an empty theater, doth not it follow that his wish is solitude? <laughs> When a man locks himself into a theater, an empty theater, that belongeth not to him, doth it not follow that his wish is to be soundly beaten by Master Henslow? <laughs> Hen-hearted Henslow fled London a fortnight past. <laughs> oh. How then didst thou weasel thy way through a door locked and bolted? Oh, I shall tell thee my secret. Master Henslow concealeth a second key under the flagstone three paces west of the door. <laughs> Theft and trespassing. It sets the lanthorn down on the stage and picks up the flagon. He weighs it in his hand. <laughs> Let us add public drunkenness to thy ever-growing litany of sins. Oh, a transgression thou hast never committed in all thy saintly days. <laughs> it sits on the edge of the stage and takes a drink of wine. Mm. Will, what ails thee? The plague. Oh, damn thy blood, Will, thou diseased and adulterate horsen! Thou oh. not the wine, thou dawpate coxcomb. Dost thou see a man diseased? Oh, diseased in his wit, most certain. <clears throat> Such will I grant thee, but calm thy addle brain. I weep not that this lump of flesh be diseased, but I mourn for the more general mass of flesh that is London herself. Oh, thou hast stolen away to the Rose Theater to pray and weep for the general weal? Oh, oh most priest-like. Kit, the theaters are closed. The plague worsens, ill vapors multiply. 
thou hast dwelt in London long enough to know the plague cometh to us almost every year. This feels different. Mayhap. The theaters have shut their doors ere now. Not like this. <laughs> no, not like this. The two men sit in silence, looking out at the empty house. Kit reclaims the wine, takes a long swig. He studies the bottle. Oh. <laughs> I have read of a scholar of Morocco, long dead, who wrote that the plague was born through the air by minute bodies that carry filth. <laughs> by gnats and fleas, I <laughs> trow. No, nay, invisible minute bodies, as he said. What, on the backs of pinhead goblins, pinching I, men to plague? <laughs> I know not. Yeah. Yet further did he write that strong drink would drive the bodies forth as sprites flee ringing church bells. He, he pours some of the wine into his hand. Will, scandalized, takes the plague and back again. I see thou art not to be trusted. Tis twice now thou hast periled my wine. A third chance thou shalt not have this night. What pagan fables else are taught at Cambridge? Mm. When thou liest moaning on thy deathbed, tis then thou wilt repent thy filth-caked hands. <laughs> I am on my deathbed, Kit. Oh, blood, thou puling babe, leave thy baseless moans. I am not in jest. Oh, but thou art in thy cups. A fathom deep if thy flagon was full when thou didst pilfer it. <laughs> Exchanging words with thee is as fruitful as shouting at a painted post. Forgive me, Will. My heart is sick as yours, and its only sucker is an idle tongue. And it's partly for thy idle tongue's sake that I love thee, but by my troth, tis oft a time that I should like to tear it out. Kit, dost thou know why I left Stratford? There are reasons upon which I might wager, but none I know for certain. Burbage and Kemp bespeak that it grows long of thy troubled marriage bed. A fair conjecture, but a false one. Then wherefore? It likes my father much to tell a story of my boyhood days when I would aid him in his work. A cutting rough the calf skins into smaller lengths that would by and by be fashioned into gloves. When wielded I the shears, as he telleth, I might be seen waving the blade thus, as twere a sharpened sword, and declaiming to the deaf ears of dead calves in as high a style as any traveling tragedian. <laughs> well, my schoolmaster despaired for my Latin, for all that I would glean from his learned lectures were the lessons of Seneca and Plautus, but none who know me in Stratford felt in any wise astonishment when I left my, behind my family for the London stage. Anne, my wife, knows well that she might have tied me to the bedstock with multitudes of curious knots. And yet would I have dragged the stock, the bed, and every sheep behind me on the road to London town. The world hath not yet devised the words that might express my soul's devout zeal towards the playing and the writing of plays. Thus to whip my joy away, it is an agony. It would be anguish now for such a banishment to befall only myself, but to see the general wheel deprived of what is, to my mind, the richest jewel, the, the brightest heaven of invention. To me, tis like the sun itself is dimmed and the world hath lost its colors. Dost thou know why I sought thee out tonight? Oh, my presumption is thy credit with mine hostess of the tavern is run out. <laughs> and thou didst desire to drink pawn mine instead. Oh, ass. <laughs> uh, I finished my perusal of thy new play. My Richard. Hi. And? Oh, well, <laughs> It's perfect. Oh, I. I want to see Burbage, the lesser, the crook, king upon the stage. Oh, tell me, wondrous. Every tragedy for generations now, long gone lives, and they just say, Shakespeare's ritual before. I am 
going to hop in real quick as the stage manager and say, Phoebe, something has gone horrifically wrong with thy microphone. <gasps> oh. Me. All right, speak again, oh, good right. Marlo. Mm. What were you saying Steve about Burbage bluster, the crookback king upon this stage. Oh, it will be wondrous. Mm. Every tragedy and for generations will long their lives away to play Will Shakespeare's Richard the Third. <laughs> it will be difficult indeed to see Burbage bluster anything upon this stage while the doors lock tight, and he himself is traipsing through the provinces to flee the plague. He stands and offers his hand to Will. Come, stand up. Wherefore? Thou art no Burbage, but it will serve. Give me, thy, give me the wine. When Will does so grudgingly, <clears throat> Kit takes a long swig, then tosses away the empty flagon. <gasps> Horse and rogue! <gasps> what sort of coarse, unpolished language is that for thy well-witted Machiavel of a king? It positions Will, center stage, facing the empty house. All right, come. Let's have thy Richard. <laughs> oh, a Richard for no one. For an empty theater. For thy invisible, minute bodies. <laughs> no, Will for me. He hops down off the stage and sits in the center of the house, looking up at Will expectantly. I feel most foolish, Kit. Were thy calfskins a worthier and more considered audience than I? No one is a worthier or more considered audience than you, Kit. <laughs> then begin. Not the first speech? Hmm, tis the finest of speeches, uh, but nay. Let us begin with Anne. Richard and Anne, oh, if thy play hath a weakness, tis that the best scene cometh so early. <laughs> Will casts his eyes up as if he's glancing at the script, fully written inside of his head. He composes himself. Those eyes of thine from mine have drawn salt tears, chained their aspect with store of childish drops. These eyes that never shed remorseful tear, no, when my father York and Edward wept to hear the piteous moan that Rutland made when black-faced Clifford shook his sword at him. My manly eyes did scorn a humble tear, and what these sorrows could not thence exhale, thy beauty hath, and made them blind with weeping. By my, now, he is speaking only to Kit. My tongue could never learn sweet, smoothing word, but now thy beauty is proposed my fee. My proud heart sues and prompts my tongue to speak. It comes to the edge of the stage and Will crouches down to look him in the eye. Teach not thy lips such scorn for they were made for kissing lady, not for such contempt. Will offers his hand to Kit and pulls him up onto the stage. If thy revengeful heart cannot forgive, lo, here I lend thee this sharp pointed sword which if thou please to hide in this true bosom and let the soul forth that adoreth thee, I lie it naked to the deadly stroke and humbly beg the death upon my knee. Will kneels before Kit who places the dagger against Will's throat. A pause, it is full of tension. Kit lets the dagger holding, Kit lets the hand holding the dagger fall to dangle at his side. Oh, take up the sword again or take up me. Rise, dissembler, though I wish thy death, I will not be thy executioner. Will it, stands, takes Kit's unresistant hand, and twists it and the dagger back towards his exposed breast, gently and firmly. Their bodies are very near to one another. Then bid me kill myself, and I will do it. I have already. Tush, that was in thy rage. Speak it again, and even with the word, that hand which for thy love did kill thy love, shall for thy love kill afar truer love. To both their deaths thou shalt be accessory. I would I knew thy heart. Their faces are very close together now. The dagger clatters to the floor. Kit's hand is clutched hard in Will's, the fingers against his throat. Oh, tis figured in my tongue. Oh, I fear me both are false. Then never man was true 
their noses are practically touching. There is a long, tense pause. Suddenly, a light stabs through the house. A rough voice shouts, Oi! The door's open! Kit and Will spring apart as though burned. Kit scrambles to douse their lanthorn. Will snaps at him in a furious hiss. Thou tristamped incipient, thou hast left the door agape? Methinks thou toldst me hen-hearted Henslow fled the city. He did! The light what? just chomed me, Henslow's partner, conceal thyself! Oh, devil take thee, where? No. Will pulls up the trap door in the center of the stage. The angry voices are closer. In the trap, the poxy jackdaw! Oh, down to hell where we blasphemers belongeth. Oh, uh, sew up thy wagging tongue. The lanthorn, damn thy eyes, the lanthorn. Kit springs across the stage, grabs the darkened lanthorn, and both men dive under the stage. The trapdoor falls shut, just as the light from the invaders sweeps the space. Who goes there? Unfold thyself. The light waves wildly over this empty stage. Beelzebub's balls, charm laid out, drunk and dreaming. Methinks I heard. The light lingers on the trap for a long moment, and then it and the voices recede. A pot of ale thou owest me in recompense. Aye, aye. A moment of silence. Then the trap bumps open to the barest sliver. Will sticks his head up and looks around. Kit pops up next to him. All's well. The resounding sound of a door slamming shut reverberates through the theater, followed by the tumblers of a lock. Thou hast the key still. Oh, aye. Safe and sound. <laughs> Another sound. A bar falling into place. Canst thou and thy key contend with a barred door? <laughs> Nay? Your pardon, Kit. It seemeth thou art trapped. <laughs> Kit fetches the flagon from where he tossed it. He shakes it hopefully, then upends it disconsolately. Nothing. And we have no more wine. Oh, uh, thou hast drained it dry, thou gluttonish sot. <laughs> Tis most fortunate, then, that thy Richard the Third is such a tedious piece of work. It should keep us in business the remainder of the night. What, and we too play every part? Oh, thou sure hast conned it every word. <laughs> Nay, but we shall manage. A play entire for an empty house? We each shall be the audience for the other. For now, it will have to be enough. Aye, Kit. Tis enough. Thank you both. Uh, this was John Carone as Will Shakespeare and Phoebe Thompson as Kit Marlowe. Ah, oh, I really appreciated hearing you deliver those lines. It sounded so nice. All right, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in to today's Sunday showcase of new plays. Next week, we'll be here with a Friday funny, although I can't offhand remember what it is. It will be uh, Friday at 7.30. Perhaps Estefania in the comments can type out the title of whatever is happening on Friday. We will be taking a break next week from Majestic Peace Theater, but you can come back the week after to see Lissa Strada, which will be directed and adapted by Corey Warren. Next week, we do have a Sunday showcase, however, and that will be Prison is Where I Learned to Fly by Rochelle Duffy. Thank you all so much, and I hope you have a wonderful day. <laughs>